Luke 1, 32 through 33, just these two verses today. We've been talking about the titles of Jesus given by the angel to Mary and to Joseph when he comes and he gives them this prophecy, really, of here's what's going to here's what's going to happen to you. This message from God. Here's what's going to happen. Baby's going to be born. He's going to be from the Holy Spirit. First thing he says is you're going to call his name Jesus, which means salvation. And so we talked about what it means that Jesus is our salvation. And then we said that he will be called the Son of God. And so we talked about how Jesus is the divine Son of God. He is fully God. And then we talked about how he is called Emmanuel. Emmanuel means God with us. And we talked about how he is the fully God, Son of God, who came to earth and became fully man. And now today, the final title, if you will, of given to Jesus is not actually a title, but it's a statement made about him that of his kingdom there will be no end, that he will be the king over everything forever. Before we read our text today, I want to pray for us, and then we're going to jump into this, and I want to explain to you what's going on, why this is so cool, and who Jesus is for us today. So Father, we thank you for your word. We are here today as your people because you have spoken to us through the Bible. Lord, we ask that you would bless the reading of your word today as we spend time in it. Help me as I preach to my brothers and sisters here. Help me to say what is true and helpful in a way that is loving and kind. Help me to point them to the truth of your word. Show us all the glory of Christ. Show us all the glory of our King. Lord, we love you, and we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Luke 1, 32 and 33. Let me read this to us today. The angel has come to Mary, and this is what he says to her. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Notice there are three promises in there. We'll break those down really quickly. The first is that God will give him the throne of his father, David. And this is important because God had promised to David that there would be a man on the throne forever. And at this point in history, it had been almost 400 years since, uh, excuse me, longer than that, over 400 years since the last king was on the throne of David. In fact, they had been conquered by the Romans in that time, and now the people who sat on their thrones were not even Jewish sometimes. And so this promise was a great one to those who had been waiting for the consolation of Israel, as it's called later on in Luke. But let me read to you from 2 Samuel 8 through 16. I gave you this in your notes. It says, Now therefore, this is God to David, Or to Nathan the prophet, he says, Thus shall you say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, that you should be prince over my people Israel. And I've been with you wherever you went and have cut off all your enemies from before you. And I'll make for you a great name like the name of the great ones of the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them so that they may dwell in their own place and be disturbed no more. Violent men shall afflict them no more as formerly from the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel. And I'll give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the sons of men. But my steadfast love will not depart from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away from before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. And then, like I said, there were several hundred years of kings, some good, some bad. And then eventually, that throne ended And so for the angel to say to Mary and to Joseph that 
God is going to come dwell among us. He's going to be with you, and he is going to sit on the throne of his father David. He's going to take back the kingdom that was promised. And now we know he didn't actually fulfill that promise yet. That is waiting. He was the king. He is the king of the Jews. Remember, they wrote that on his cross, the king of the Jews. They did it to mock him, but they were right. And Herod was afraid. Herod, who was the king over the Jews, was an evil man at that time. And he was afraid because Jesus was called the king of the Jews. And yet Jesus tells his disciples several times, I didn't come to establish an earthly kingdom. That's not what I've come here to do. And yet this promise is that he will sit on the throne of his father David and that he will reign over the house of Jacob, which is an associated promise, but even bigger, that he's not just going to sit on David's throne, he's going to sit on the throne over all Israel. And even more than that, of his kingdom, there will be no end. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Of his kingdom, there will be no end. So he, he fulfills the promise to David, the covenant to David that he'll have a king forever. And yet, it's not quite there yet, but he is the king in heaven over everything and of his kingdom there will be no end. So let's talk about this a little bit more. Here, here's the big, the big idea today is that Jesus is the promised king. That's the first set of blanks there. Jesus is the promised king. The people were waiting they were waiting for a king. There is a truth that to have an evil king over a country or over a kingdom makes it very hard for the people of that kingdom to live in peace. And yet, when there is a good king on the throne, there is no better system of government than when there is a good and righteous king on the throne who always makes the right decisions and who always does what is good for not only the nation, but for the people. We've never seen a king like that ever. There are no kings like that today. There never have been any kings like that in all of history. There were some kings that maybe could be called good kings, and yet Jesus, he's a different kind of king altogether. He is the perfect one. He is God become man. And so when we talk about Jesus coming as king, it shouldn't scare us. It shouldn't be like, oh man, we're going to lose our freedom or anything like that. It's because when Christ rules, it is the ultimate freedom. Okay, here's number one. Jesus is the promised king, but Jesus is the king. He's the king of the universe. He's the king of the universe. He's not the king over Israel only. He's not the king over America. He's not the king over just the world. He is the king of the universe. Every single thing that exists or ever has existed or ever will exist belongs to him. Revelation 19.16 says this of Jesus. On his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. In other words, there is no king higher than Jesus. He is the one who is the king of the kings. He is the one who is the Lord of the lords. Here's Hebrew 1.8. Of the Son, he says, talking of Jesus, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. Now this, we could have included this two weeks ago when we talked about Jesus as fully God. That here the writer of Hebrews quotes the Psalms and says, of Jesus, this is what the Psalms said, O God, your, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. But this is the other thing that it says here. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. In other words, the scepter, right, the, the, the instrument, the symbol of reign and authority is uprightness. That's what he has, a scepter of uprightness. He always does what is good and what is right. But he's the king of the universe. That's the first point there. Here's the second. Jesus is sovereign over everything. Jesus is sovereign over everything. Everything. Also from Hebrews 1, Verses 3 and 4 says he's the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited 
is more excellent than theirs. The phrase I really want us to look at there is that he upholds the universe by the word of his power. So first we're talking about, like you said, the universe. This is not Jesus who is in control of a few things. You and I can uphold about 10 things at once, right? We just don't have that much power. We feel like we're in control of our lives, but we're really not. Like so many things just happen to us, and there we are. And yet Jesus, it says, not only is he in control of the whole universe, but he upholds it, that he literally keeps it existing. He sustains every single thing that exists. And he doesn't do it by holding it up with physical hands. He says he does it by the word of his power. That by the will of Christ, the universe exists and continues to exist. That when you get in your car in the morning, the fact that your car exists and you exist is because Christ is upholding the universe by the word of his power. And when you start your car, the reason that that ignites the, the gasoline in the engine is because Christ has declared by his will that that is how it's going to work. That every single thing you do is because of Christ who upholds the universe by the word of his power. The atheist who says there is no God is able to breathe and speak because Christ upholds the universe by the word of his power. There is not a single thing in all creation that is not underneath the authority of Jesus. He's sovereign over everything. And so when we say he's not like other kings, we mean it. He's in a different category altogether. R.C. Sproul talks about maverick molecules. I don't know if you've ever heard him say this. But the idea here is that in the sovereignty of Christ, there is not a single molecule in the universe that is out of place. That if there was even one maverick molecule, then that thing would be the king of kings because it would be outside the authority of Jesus. And yet every single thing, every atom, every dust mote is under the sovereign authority of Jesus and he upholds it by the word of his power. Here's number three. Jesus is also the judge of the world. Jesus is judge of the world. It's part of being king. Solomon did lots of judging. If you remember, he was known for his wisdom. There's a story of the woman who brings a baby that she had stolen, and the mother comes running in behind her, and they both say, this is my baby. Now, Solomon doesn't know either one of them, and he asks the question, well, what should we do? And they're debating back and forth, and he says, I have an idea. Let's cut the baby in half, because he knew well, the mom is going to say, absolutely not, let her keep it. And the woman who's stolen the baby is like, all right, let's cut it in half. That'll work for me. Now, the reason that I point that out is because Solomon here, he's the king. He's the judge. People come to him to arbitrate and to figure out, okay, who's right, who's wrong. And Jesus also sits in authority to fill that role as well. He is the judge of the world. He will decide what is right and what is wrong. Here's 2 Corinthians 5.10. Paul says this to believers, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Now notice, this is not the judgment seat of the Father. This is not just the judgment seat. This is the judgment seat of Christ. That's part of the throne. It's that he sits as the one who decides right and wrong. Now, Jesus has the added benefit of being fully God. And so when Jesus decides what is right and wrong. He decides not of his own, not because, well, you know, this would be nice or this might feel right, but being goodness incarnate, he decides what is right and what is wrong. Okay? So these are three truths about Jesus. Let's make it more personal here. Here's the next big set of blanks here. Jesus is the king. Is he my king? That's the question we have to ask. Jesus is the king is he my king? Now, I'm not saying, is he in charge of you? Is he, does he have authority over you? Is he the king over your life? Because he is, whether you submit to him or not. But the question we have to ask is, is he my king? Three things we must do because these things are true of Christ. Here's number one. I must bow down and worship. I must bow down and worship. Philippians 2, 9 through 11 says this. 
Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now notice what it says here. It doesn't say so that the knees of those who love him will bow. It says that every knee will bow. And in case you were confused about what that meant, in heaven and on earth and under the earth. That's every knee that exists will bow before the name of Jesus. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Now some will do it willingly and it will be an experience of great joy and victory, and triumph. And then there will be people who do it unwillingly, who even in the midst of Christ come back to earth will still hate him, will still want to rebel against him, who will refuse to bow, and the scepter of his uprightness will make them bow. And so the question is, which will it be for us? Will we choose to rebel against God, and God have to submit us and bend our knee for us, Or will we bend our knee willingly and worship the only one who is worthy? Here's number two. I must submit to Jesus' rule. I must submit to Jesus' rule. John 14, 15. One of the most haunting passages of Scripture, John reminds us this truth from Jesus' mouth. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. What Jesus is saying there is, we can say all day, I love Jesus. But at the end of the day, whether we obey him or not, is the real test of our love. A lot of people say, I love Jesus. And yet they break God's commands like it's nothing. It's so easy to find ourselves in rebellion against God and to give God lip service at the same time. If Jesus has said, do not do this, and you do it anyway, you're saying to Jesus, I don't love you. So if you claim to be a Christian, and yet you're committing adultery, living in sexual immorality, living in drunkenness, constantly lying, stealing, hating, holding grudges, getting revenge, gossiping, slandering, dishonoring your parents, having abortions, clicking on pornography, cheating your employer, whatever it may be, if you claim to be a Christian and yet you disobey the words of Christ, Jesus says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And therefore, if you don't keep my commandments, you don't love me. Right? I can say all day I love my wife. And I do say that all the time. And if you're married, you should say that all the time. And yet, what she's really looking for is not the words that I say, but the things that I do. If I text my wife, hey, I love you, while I'm on the way to have an affair, I don't love her. I can say it all I want, but I don't. If I say I love her, and yet she asks me to do something, and I outright refuse, or I dishonor her amongst other people, or I lie to her, I don't really love her. I might like her. I might want something from her, but I don't really love her. And that's how it is with Christ. If he is the king of your life and you love him, do you submit to him as the king? And also, the great thing about Jesus' commands is that he doesn't give us commands to make our lives hard. He doesn't. I think so many unbelievers see the Bible as just a big list of rules of don't do this and do this. And Christ has come to set us free from that. I mean, the book of Romans is all about that. We don't served by the old way of the law. We serve by the new way of the Spirit. We're not bound up in a set of rules, although there are rules. We're set free to do what's right. Here's what Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30, Jesus says this. I love this. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Notice there is a yoke, but it's easy and light. And a yoke, just a reminder, in case you don't spend a lot of time around oxen, a yoke is this thing that they put on beasts of burden, right? Whether it be an ox 
or I think only oxen will actually take a yoke. I think other horses maybe, I don't know. At least oxen will take this yoke. They put it on two oxen at once, and they work together to pull something. Sometimes it's more than two. Sometimes there's two in a yoke and then two behind them. And the idea is of a yoke that, yeah, it is, uh, it's labor, right? You put it on and you work. Oxen don't just wear the yoke around because it's comfortable. They put it on to work. And yet Jesus says, not only take this yoke and pull my sleigh, he says, take the yoke that I'm also under and I'm going to help you pull because my burden is easy and light. We convince ourselves so easily that sin is better than following Jesus, that maybe God is holding something back from us. And yet King Jesus gives us commands because he loves us. Proverbs 14, 12 says, There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way to death. That we might feel good about the path we're taking. We might say, well, maybe God is wrong about this. I'm going to do this anyway because this seems like the right way to go. And the author of this proverb says, hey, in case you're that guy and you think that you're on the right way and you're rebelling against God, that way leads to death. Two verses later, he says this, the backslider in heart will be filled with the fruit of his ways and a good man will be filled with the fruit of his ways. That whatever path we choose, whether we submit to Christ or rebel against him, there is fruit that's coming, there is consequences for whatever it is. Whether we honor him, there's blessing, or if we dishonor him, there's death. So here's the question, not just for you guys, but for me also, for all of us. Do we submit to Jesus as our king? Or are, are we our own king? Is he my king or my king of my own life? And then if I say that Christ is king, do I obey him as king or do I just pay him lip service? Matthew 15, 8, Jesus says of the Pharisees, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And he's quoting Isaiah there. This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. May it never be said of us. Let's submit to Jesus' rule. Here's number three. I must repent and believe. Oh yeah, these are supposed to match up with the truths about Jesus, by the way. So Jesus being the king of the universe means we should worship him. Jesus being the sovereign over everything means it's only reasonable and right to submit to him. And because Jesus is judge of the world, we must repent and believe. That's number three. I must repent and believe. Because if Jesus is just the judge of the world and not also the savior of the world, every single one of us is in trouble. Romans 2, 4 through 5. Paul is making this argument about the fallenness of all people. And then he, he looks at the Jewish people here and he says, you guys who have the law, you who know what is true and right and judge other people, do you also judge yourself? Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? But because of your hard and impenitent heart, you're storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. Let's not confuse ourselves. There is a day of wrath. God's righteous judgment will be revealed. And the question is not going to be, are you good enough? Because none of us are good enough. The question is going to be, have you taken advantage of the kindness and mercy of God and repented and turned to Jesus or not? Romans 3, 21 through 30, the greatest passage in all of Scripture, I'm convinced, says this. Now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith 
in Jesus. A few things I want to break down here. Y'all thought you were going to get away from the word propitiation this week? Here, to, here it is. Propitiation, again, just a reminder. It is a sacrifice that takes away the wrath of God. That's what that word means, propitiation. The sacrifice that takes away the wrath of God. That God was right to be wrathful toward us, to be angry at our sin because we had dishonored him. All of us, all have fallen short of the glory of God. Every single one. And then, and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. We didn't earn it. It was given. We don't deserve it. It was grace. We didn't buy it. Christ bought us. Because God put him forward as a propitiation by his blood. And notice, not to be earned, not to be bought, but to be received by faith. It's faith. It's always been faith and faith alone. This was to show God's righteousness because God wanted to forgive sins and yet God is the just judge. Jesus wants to forgive and yet there has to be justice. And so because Christ died, he paid the penalty for sin on the cross and rose again. Now he can be just, he can be the righteous judge who punishes evil and rewards good and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So he can be just and yet call not guilty those who are guilty because they're covered by the blood of Christ. So then here's verse 27. Then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. In other words, we got nothing to boast about. By what kind of law? By a law of works? No. But by the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also. That's us, by the way. Since God is one who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. It's always been faith. It still is faith. It always will be faith. Here's Ephesians 2, 8 and 10, in case you still don't believe me. By grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So that it's not faith plus good works equals salvation. The biblical pattern is faith equals salvation plus good works. That we don't have to earn our way into God's good graces because we can't. He offers us salvation by faith. And then he says, that when we are created anew in Christ, there are good works for us to walk in. John Owen says this, we contribute nothing to our salvation but the sin that made it necessary. We need a Savior, we have one, and he has saved us by our faith. <coughs> okay. So here's the final thought. Christmas is not just about the manger. We talk about the manger a lot, songs about the manger, it's not just about the manger. It's about the cross. But even the cross was just a moment in time and a means to an end. Jesus is not still on the cross. He's risen. There's a reason that the cross behind me is empty. That's because Jesus was only on the cross for a few hours. And he's not there anymore. The death that he died, he died once for all. That's what we read in Hebrews 7, 27, 9, 12, 9, 26, 10, 2, and 10, 10. I'll use that phrase that Jesus died once for all. He's already done it. He will never suffer again for us. That is done. It was finished then and there for all eternity. So they took him off the cross and laid him in a tomb. But we also don't celebrate the tomb because he's not there anymore either. He was only there for two days. And then he overcame death because the grave could not hold him. And then a few weeks later, he ascended to heaven where he now sits on heaven's throne at the right hand of God the Father where he waits for the day when he will establish his kingdom forever and fully upon the earth. And all those who have believed in him and called on his name will rise with him to everlasting glory and we will take our place around the throne of Jesus Christ our God and worship him forever and ever. Amen. Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you for the gift of Jesus. That you have saved us by grace through faith. That this is not our own doing because we couldn't do it. But you loved us anyway. 
And that by your love, you sent Jesus, who lived a perfect life and died a perfect death and rose again and who now sits on the throne of heaven, our King and our God, who we praise. We wait for the day when Jesus comes back again. Lord, help us to submit to Christ's rule. Help us to worship him as he deserves. Help us to repent and believe and there find salvation for our souls. Lord, we are in need, and Christmas reminds us that we are in need every day of a Savior, and you've given him in Jesus Christ. Lord, to those who are here today who do not believe, grant them faith, open their eyes, cover, uncover their eyes from the blinders that Satan has put there, that they might see the glory of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that they might know their need for a Savior and that they would turn to him in repentance and faith and be saved. Lord, for us who are here today, who are following Jesus, help us to carry on. Bring us to the end. <coughs> Take us all the way so that we could be with you forever in eternity. We love you. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.